Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the women of, the, of Lincoln County Committee, we would like to um, welcome you to this portrait unveiling of Willa McCord Blake Eastlick. I would like to rec recognize at this time the committee, along with myself, Carolyn Denton, is Phyllis Hicklin, Dorothy Small, Carol Foster, Lucy Williams, Eugene Hamm, Sandy Williams, Angie Butler, and Amy Sexton. I'd also like to recognize this morning's speakers. We have Reverend Tommy Van from Fayetteville First United Methodist Church, Dwight Sexton, Eugene Hamm, Amy Eastlick Sexton, who is the great great niece of today's honoree, and Lucy Williams. Uh, Mayor Bill Newman sends his regrets that he could not be with us this morning, and Mayor Donna Hartman is in a work session with the city, and we hope that she'll be able to step over before we finish this morning. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Caroline. I appreciate uh, the introduction. It's, I'm honored to be a part of the festivities for today. I understand that Mrs. Eastlick uh, had a Methodist background, so that is my connection, and uh, I'm thankful for that connection. But we have a greater connection, don't we? A connection we have to our not only our families, but to our communities, uh, to, uh, to the, those who govern us, and we're thankful for those partnerships we have, and even the partnerships that we have on just a nuclear level within our family, because that connection to family is what projected Miss Eastlick into uh, her notoriety today. So uh, let us go to God in prayer. Dear God, we give you thanks for this absolutely pristinely beautiful day. We're thankful for the blossoms uh, that we see around this courthouse lawn, for many of the tulip poplars that are, uh, that are blossoming all over the place, uh, our state tree. We're thankful for hearing the birds that are in the air, and the mockingbird is probably heard, and that's our state bird. We're so thankful for the ways in which that we're reminded just around us in our community of your creative work and power among us and of how you partner with us and ask us to be co-creators with you in uh, maintaining stewardship of our earth. And for you, we are grateful. We're thankful for you sending your son Jesus uh, to show us that we are made in the very image of God and to uh, ordain for us that we are to be good neighbors. We're thankful for the life of Willa McCord Blake Eastlick. We're thankful for her partnership in her marriage where she was able to uh, take up the gauntlet and continue uh, the work of, that her husband was unfortunately had to leave among his death, but uh, to continue his ministry, his mission in the world at our state legislature. And in so doing, she became the first woman uh, to help uh, further the cause uh, of the needs of our communities at the state level. We're thankful for their marriage and their partnership that projected her into that role. We're also thankful that uh, you have uh, asked us to continue in partnering with each other as we go forward seeking to be in unity with one another. And unity does not mean uniformity. Unity means that we are, in spite of our differences, we have a common goal that we can look toward and we can become better because of our diversity, not because of our sameness. We're thankful for the life of Willa McCord Blake Eastlick and may her portrait uh, stand forever as a reminder that uh, women have an equal role in society, in our homes, and in our government's uh, offices to help further the cause of our kingdom. We need to be reminded as we are getting closer to Easter that the first person that Jesus showed himself to was a woman in a garden. This setting in a garden uh, affirming the life of women Women among us, especially in this month of women's history, we are grateful. May we always look to those who have forged uh, the path forward for us and be grateful. And uh, we're thankful for your son Jesus who forged peace and life and love and joy amongst us in your life. May we all be grateful. This we pray in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
I chose this song for in uh, honor for what Willa and her husband stood for in the Veterans Administration, supporting the veterans and the, getting the, the program started for what veterans enjoy today and can partake of. It's called Soldiers and Jesus. This is the obituary for Mrs. Eastlick, which appeared in the Congressional Record. Willa McCord Blake Eastlick, wife of Everett, Edward Everett Eastlick, a representative from Tennessee, was born in Fayetteville, Lincoln County, Tennessee, September the 8th, 1878. She was the daughter of Dr. George W. Blake and Eliza McCord Blake. She attended the private schools in Fayetteville, also Dick White College, formerly Milton College, in Fayetteville. The Winthrop Model School, which was not a school for fashion models, it was a, an ideal or model school, uh, the forerunner of Peabody's Demonstration School, uh, now University School, I think. And then she was uh, also a student at Peabody in Nashville, and both the Metropolitan College of Music and the Synthetic School of Music in New York City. 
She was a member of the State Democratic Committee, elected as a Democrat to the 72nd Congress to fill the vacancy caused by the death of her husband, Edward E. Eastley. She served from August the 4th, 1932 to March the 3rd, 1933. She was not eligible for re-election to the 73rd Congress, not having qualified for uh, nomination as required by the state. She died in Pulaski, Tennessee on February 18, 1861 and is interred in the Maple Wood Cemetery. Today we gather to honor the life and legacy of one of Fevel's crown jewels, the most honorable Willa McCord Blake Eastlick. Willa is best known as the first woman ever elected to serve in the U.S. Congress from the great state of Tennessee. That was in 1932. Back in those days, the U.S. House of Representatives terms were two years as opposed to the current four years. And each new congressional session was sworn in March following their election instead of January as it is today. This becomes important in the timing of events leading up to Willa's service dates. Her husband, Ed Eastlick, had served the seventh congressional district of Tennessee for seven years from his election in November, 1924 until his sudden death, June 14, 1932, halfway into his fourth term. Congressman Eastlick had been deeply worried about important upcoming legislation. Leading up to that fateful day, he prepared a speech he planned to make to Congress. Willa knew how close this legislation was to her husband's heart and decided to attend the day's session. She had just made herself comfortable in the gallery overlooking the House floor when he rose to speak. He had come ready to fight for House votes to win passage of the Patman Soldiers Bill, which would lay the framework for the Veterans Bill many years later. It was a highly worthy and admirable cause considering the times. Ed was in the middle of his emotionally charged speech when he faltered mid-sentence, swayed, and tried to brace himself as he collapsed to the House floor. He was quickly moved to a nearby antechamber where the Capitol physician determined he had suffered a fatal heart attack. He was only 60 years old. A special election to fill Ed's vacant seat was announced by Governor Henry Horton. It occurred on the same day as the Democratic primary election on August 4, 1932. With all the encouragement of her family, friends, and associations, Willa chose to run and went on to win by a clear majority, gleaning 51% of the votes. As I mentioned earlier, the timing of events would play a huge role in Willa's congressional service dates. Ed's death had occurred after the deadline to file for congressional primary race, so Willa was not eligible for re-election. She was only able to serve out the remaining time of her late husband's fourth term. In fact, Willa wasn't actually sworn into office in Washington, D.C. until Congress reconvened from their fall break in early December 1932 she would only serve a short three months. She could have very easily sat on her laurels and rode out those last months, but that was simply not in her nature. She had always been tenacious in her life's work. She rose to the occasion by serving on several congressional committees, the Public Buildings and Ground Committee, the Committee on World War Veterans Legislation, the Post Office Committee, and later in February 1933, the Memorial Committee planning the late Calvin Coolidge funeral. 
Her goals were centered around both her own and her late husband's causes, and she made every effort to finalize some of his unfinished work. In her last public buildings and grounds committee meeting, Chairman U.S. Representative Fritz Garland Lanham of Texas commemorated her departure saying, her outstanding ability, her keen intellect, which have enabled her so faithfully to carry on for her people and for the nation are of the same efficient character as her husband. And he added, we part with her with regret because of the service she has rendered and could render to our common country. Willa McCord Blake was born September 8, 1878 in an extremely close yet blended family. She was the youngest child of 10 for her father, Dr. George Washington Blake, a well-known and respected physician and druggist in Fayetteville. He was the son of John M. Blake and grandson of Hugh Montgomery Blake, one of the earliest settlers and a mercantile storekeeper in Petersburg. Dr. G.W. Blake's first wife was Henrietta Metcalf Blake who he had married in 1852. Her Metcalf family had also been early Petersburg settlers and storekeepers. Henrietta Blake passed away in 1866 at the young age of 32 during an outbreak of cholera that had hit Lincoln County that fall. She had given birth to Dr. Blake's first five children. First, there was Thaddeus Metcalf otherwise known as Caddy Blake, who was born in 1855, but who died unexpectedly in 1861. Then came William Mert Blake in 1858 and George Everett Blake in 1860, followed by Laura Lou Ella Blake in 1862 and John B. Blake in 1864. These all became Willa's siblings when Dr. Blake remarried in November 1867 to Miss Eliza Hansel McCord. Eliza's parents were Samuel Hanley Cowan McCord and Carolyn Willa Elmira Hansel. Also, Willa established families in Lincoln County. Their roots ran deep going back to the earliest days of our country when Robert Cowan served in the American Revolutionary Army. G.W. and Eliza quickly expanded their immediate family by giving birth to Percy H. Blake in 1868, Samuel Morgan Blake in 1870, Mary W., otherwise known as Mamie Blake in 1871, and Luther Lee Blake in 1874 before Willa's birth in 1878. When Willa was born, her father was 56 and her mother, Eliza, had just turned 41. Shortly after his first wife's death in 1866 and his mother's death in 1868, Dr. Blake acquired a lot in Fevel for his new home. Later that year, he moved his family to town. He became a joint proprietor of the Smith, Blake & Company dry goods and drugstore in Fayetteville and then opened his own drugstore on the new north side of the square in 1870 with Dr. S. M. McElroy, a fellow physician known as an experienced practitioner and druggist. Under Eliza's influence, Dr. Blake became very active in both educational and church activities. Willa's mother's emphasis on the importance of proper education was instrumental in all her children's upbringing and careers. Bearing in mind that Willa was only seven years old when her father passed, it is clear that her creative and artistic talents were nurtured more by her mother. Willa initially attended schools in Fayetteville, including Dick White College, formerly Melton College, located on the hill behind where the old Serbian building stands today on West College Street. 
In March 1891, her mother decided to move the family to Nashville. Her oldest son, George, had relocated there after starting his career in the insurance business and then serving as the U.S. Postmaster in Fayetteville. George had married in 1886 Blanche Morgan, daughter of William Claiborne Morgan, who served as Lincoln County Circuit Court Clerk for 16 years, and whose brother, William Smith Morgan, went on to serve as the Tennessee Secretary of State for eight years under three governors. Willa was only 13. Upon their arrival in Nashville, Eliza and the children settled in on Fatherland Street in Edgefield, East Nashville. Willa was only 13 at the time, but soon entered the Winthrop Model School. This school was founded to introduce a new, innovative teaching training method. Winthrop later became the Peabody Demonstration School, which is still operating as the University School of Nashville on Edge Hill Avenue, just off 21st. Brother Sam chose to head to Birmingham and went on to make a 40-year career as deputy clerk and clerk of city courts in that fair city. His home became the winter retreat for Eliza and Willa when they moved with Brother Luther to New York City in late 1899. The oldest brother, George, made his mark as secretary to the state funding board in Nashville. In 1895, he went about codifying the detailed accounting processes for the management of state funds and produced three volumes of books on the subject. When Eliza moved the family to New York City, Willa, now 23, was encouraged to pursue her artistic talents by attending the Synthetic School of Music, which then merged into what we know today as the Metropolitan College of Music. She was also known for her fine singing voice. Her brother Luther started working as a stock market trader, stock broker in 1901. His work led him to found the Standard Statistics Company Incorporated in 1914. He later merged his company with Poor's Publishing in 1941. This firm became Standard and Poor's. His creation gave investors a better overall view of the market and laid the groundwork for the first computer-generated index, the S&P 500. While living in New York from 1900 to 1906, Willa and her mother made the trip south each year, stopping along the way in Nashville and Fayetteville before heading to Birmingham. George's wife, Blanche, was to become a major role model for Willa's future civic and political involvement, and she heavily influenced Willa's entry into women's causes. They both served as state district chairs and delegates and represented women at several Tennessee Federation of Women's Clubs state conventions. Willa rose to host the 1915 convention in Pulaski and served in other capacities, eventually becoming chair of War Works on the Council of National Defense. The Tennessee League of Women's Clubs became a means to coordinate diverse women's groups into one united platform for the Tennessee women's suffrage movement of the late 1910s, which led to both Blanche and Willa playing an extremely instrumental role in the eventual passage of the U.S. Constitution's 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Willa's maternal grandfather, uncles and aunts on her mother's side, had all founded a somewhat regional newspaper dynasty in Middle Tennessee before Willa was born. Eliza's father founded the weekly Fevel Express newspaper in 1873. Her oldest maternal uncle, uncle Luther Wood, otherwise known as L.W. McCord, had purchased the Pulaski Citizen in 1856. 
the, the citizen is still in existence today, 168 years later. Her other uncle, Frank, also served as the Pulaski Citizen's local editor. He later purchased the Fevel Express. Eliza Blake also had a younger sister, M. Willa McCord, very likely our Willa McCord Blake's namesake, who married James Holland Wright in 1882. Her husband had purchased the new banner, the conservative newspaper in Fevel in 1896. They relocated from Fevel to Nashville in 1900 where he worked for the banner and became known as a prominent political writer. Putting those close relatives to Willa into perspective, her mother's family connections with the all-powerful press, if combined with politics, would make an unbeatable union and a strong basis for political successes. This leads us to where Ed Eastlick enters the story in Willa's life. Edward Everett Eastlick was born in April 1872 and raised in Giles County on the family farm, which was the Sumac community. He had gone to Bethel College in Russellville, Kentucky, and then studied for the bar under Judge William McCollum. He passed his bar in 1893. By 1896, he was out canvassing the state for votes for both gubernatorial and presidential candidates of the Democratic Party. At only 27, he was an elector for the state at large. It can be assumed that Ed and his family would have known and crossed paths with all the McCords on numerous social and civic occasions. As well, Eliza McCord Blake and her children, including Willa, would often visit family in Pulaski. So the likelihood that Ed and Willa may have met earlier would not be out of the question. Being a tall, scholarly, and somewhat handsome young man, he had gained a statewide reputation by 1906. He would have well qualified on a short, eligible bachelor list, one could say, and would easily have caught Willa's eye. Willa herself would have been quite the catch as well. As early as 1895, at age 17, she had been described as a beautiful young woman possessing charms that won her friends by the score. She was described by the Birmingham News as being well known as a musician and dramatic reader and has appeared in this capacity before large audiences in numerous cities. She was described another time as a tall and stately blonde. Ed and Willa were married on June 6, 1906. The wedding was at her brother Sam's home in Birmingham. They spent their honeymoon traveling to Colorado upon their return to Pulaski. Considering their similar backgrounds and individual drive, they made their move on the world of politics. As well as practicing law, Ed also engaged in banking and maintained various agricultural pursuits. He was selected as an alternate delegate to the Democratic National Convention from Tennessee in 1916 during World War I. He served as a government appeal agent for Giles County. By the 1920s, they were both ready to take on politics at a national level. In 1924, when her husband Ed decided to run for Congress, Willa took on national seats in the General Federation of Women's Clubs, as well as becoming a member of the Tennessee State Democratic Committee. By October 1924, Willa had just returned from a trip to Georgia when she spoke for the Democratic Party. The November election was upon them and Ed led out of three candidates, getting 56% of the votes to win. Willa was quick to return to Atlanta in late November to pay another visit to her sister-in-law, Blanche. The Atlanta Journal heralded her arrival under the headline, Recent Southern Tennessee Visitor of Outstanding National Importance, and naming her one of the most prominent women in the South, and an outstanding figure in all civic activities undertaken by women. On trips home from Washington, their time was never idle. Ed and Willa continued to remain active politically. 
In September 1926, Ed was speaking to the Businessmen's Club at Jackson, Tennessee with Willa in attendance. Then came more campaigning again for his second term. He was handily re-elected in November 1927. Again in October 1928, he was in Greenville in Upper East Tennessee speaking at the courthouse on behalf of the National Democratic Ticket. The Greenville Democrat called him one of the outstanding orators in the state of Tennessee. At the same time Ed was speaking in Greenville, Willa was in her hometown Fayetteville speaking before the Democratic women of Lincoln County at a tea at the home of Mrs. J. F. Madden which drew visitors from across Tennessee and Alabama. Thanksgiving 1931 found Ed and Willa being entertained back in Pulaski by relatives and friends before returning that following Saturday to Washington. Unbeknownst to them, this Thanksgiving would be their family's last together. This brings us back to the tragic event in Willa's life where we started today. After leaving office in March 1933, Willa immediately returned to Atlanta once again to spend time, unwind, and regroup with her sister-in-law Blanche and her family. There was much speculation in the press on her possibly seeking a full term in the next session of Congress. In late 1933, her name had also been tossed around to fill a vacancy on the National Civil, Civil Service Commission. Willa quietly decided to not pursue further political endeavors. Now at age 55, she finally began a life of leisure. After visiting family in Atlanta that summer and fall in 1933, Willa returned to New York City where she remained for six more years. She continued to venture south with stopovers to visit sister Mamie in Pulaski on her way to winter in Birmingham with her brother Sam as she and her mother Eliza had done in her youth. On departing to Atlanta once again in April 1934, Willa and Mamie both paid a visit to their sister-in-law Blanche. The Atlanta Journal reported that Willa has great personal charm is, and is endowed with a brilliant mentality. Her beauty combines hazel eyes with brown hair and she is the possessor of a graceful figure. Willa was approaching her 56th birthday, but she could still impress. In 1939, Willa left New York City and moved back to Pulaski, joining her sister Mamie. She maintained her membership in the American Association of University Women, Daughters of the American Revolution, United Daughters of the Confederacy and remained active in the Order of the Eastern Star. We also know she chose to avoid the summer heat by spending the month of July 1943 with Mamie at a college up in Montgomery at Mott Eagle. During the winters of 1947 to 1949, Willa and Mamie were also noted to spend time playing some major hands of bridge in tournaments in Fort Myers, Florida. Otherwise, their days were beginning to slow down and were comprised mostly of reading, visiting with friends, and receiving family and old acquaintances into their home. Mamie passed away in late October 1957, just shy of her 86th birthday. Niece Gladys, who was deaf, was known to come up from Atlanta to stay with her two aunts, often during their elder years. Matter of fact, Gladys was in Pulaski visiting Willa when Willa quietly passed away on February 18, 1961, at the age of 82. Since the day Willa had left her office in the U.S. Capitol in early March 1933, it would be 28 more years before the next woman from Tennessee was elected to serve in Congress. And I would like to add a personal note. My great-grandfather was Dale, Dan L. Eastlick, and he was Ed's brother, Willa's brother-in-law. Dan L. and his wife, Inez Bennett Eastlick, named one of their daughters Willa Blake Eastlick. And I knew my Aunt Willa. She was really, really close to my grandfather, Gene. 
And when I had a son, I named him Blake after my Aunt Willa. And I never realized where the Blake came from. Thank you. I hope everybody pay attention because we're going to be a test after this song. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. have with us Miss Donna, the mayor of Fayetteville. Miss Donna, would you like to speak today? I'm sorry I could not be with you guys from the beginning of this um, celebration of Miss Willa. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, but we had a work session this morning, and what a lovely day in Tennessee to celebrate the Lord's Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. The women of Lincoln County Committee would like to say thank you to everyone who came today to honor and celebrate the life of Willa McCord Blake Eastlick. So many women have dedicated their lives to make this community and our state the best it is, and Willa was definitely one of them. 
A special thank you to our speakers and all who were involved in making this day one to remember. The Women of Lincoln County Committee realizes the importance of women in our history. Our mission is to bring recognition of women who have made a difference in our community and each year we recognize a woman who has played such an important part. Please help us continue to do this by suggesting names of women worthy of recognition. At the last ceremony, we recognized Miss Claudia May Taylor Donaldson. Her portrait has been displayed inside the courthouse and now will be placed in the museum. We ask for Willis family to please come forward to the to the portrait. Miss Eastlick's, Eastlick's portrait would be displayed in the courthouse on the first floor for more of our community to understand, appreciate, and remember all she did. Everyone is welcome to visit the courthouse and see the portrait. If y'all would, please unveil the portrait. Again, thank y'all so much for attending.